There we go. Light is green. Um, and as uh, Rocky on Paw Patrol says, green means go. Um, but <laughs> the three-year-old uh, whose favorite color is green, we watch a lot of Paw Patrol. But <laughs> anyways, my name is Nate, and Pastor Florin is out of town this weekend, as Steve mentioned, for a wedding. And so it was a couple months ago when he asked me if I'd be able to do a, a message this morning, and I was excited to find out that the passage we're looking at is from Ruth. And uh, partly because Ruth is such a cool story, but also Ruth is a, a special name in my mom's family. See, my grandma's name is Ruth, and actually two of my grandpa's brothers also married women named Ruth. And so there's, there's the running joke that it's a good thing they married all these women named Ruth, otherwise their family would be ruthless. So, uh, but, uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and actually, it was, it was during the, this, so I was getting ready for this message, I realized that my two sons actually have something in common with King David, which is kind of cool. They have a great-grandmother named Ruth. Um, yeah, so that's, that's cool. Um, so today we're wrapping up an unlikely two-part series that we started back at Easter time. In the first part, we looked at the book of Lamentations, and then we've moved into the, the book of Ruth, and we're finishing that today. And Pastor Florence talked about a number of different lessons uh, from these two books, but for me at least, our hope in God was really kind of the, the thing that I kept coming back to, which these two Old Testament books are probably not where we would think to like, look for hope as we're um, reading through the Bible. Lamentations was written in the form of a beautiful poem that lamented the suffering of the Jewish people. And I might add that suffering happened as the result of their own failure to follow God. Obviously, the book talks a lot about suffering, but there's a brief section in the middle of the book where the poet's writing about or remembers the, the goodness and faithfulness of God. And then the book ends with the poet writing about their current anguish, which sometimes is where we are in life. Sometimes there are hurts and pains that are not resolved in this life and this world. But there is still comfort that we can find in God and in his word, such as the book of Lamentations. Then in Ruth, which is a narrative of the story of Naomi and Ruth, we learn about the tragedy and grief these two women experience as God reveals his plan for how he'll use their tragedy to bring about a glorious story of redemption. So here's a short summary of Ruth for anyone who's missed any of the messages from the series or isn't familiar with the book. So this takes place in the time a couple generations before King David was born, and there was a famine in Israel. So Elimelech and his wife Naomi and their two sons leave to go live in the land of Moab. While Naomi was living in Moab, her husband died, her two sons married Moabite women, and then her sons die as well. Naomi decides to return to her homeland in Israel. Ruth, one of her son's widows, comes with her. And then um, when they're back in Israel, Ruth goes to work to provide for the two of them and meets Boaz, who is a close relative of Naomi's husband. Uh, Boaz shows Ruth, and by extension Naomi, favor and redeems the land owned by Naomi's husband, which means he will also be marrying Ruth. Uh, I see everyone has both of their sandals on today. So no one's been, no one's purchased any land recently. If you were here last week, you remember that was, that was how in Jewish society at the time, people would formalize this transaction of purchasing land. Uh, so that's what happened last week. So this week we're, we're ending the book and it's kind of a happily ever after, I suppose, and then kind of an epilogue where the author lists a, a family genealogy which ends off with King David, uh, which is an important aspect of their story that I'll get to in a little bit. But before I read today's passage, I want you to consider a somewhat subtle aspect of the book of Ruth, and that's the story begins and ends with Naomi. The, in the arc of the story written about in the book of Ruth, she's really kind of actually the central person the story's about, even though Ruth is the one doing most of the things. It begins and ends with Naomi, and we'll, we'll circle back to how that applies to us today. So let's read the passage, and then we'll take a look at the context. Do we have the verses? All right. So starting with verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. 
May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. The genealogy of David. This then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salman, Salman the father of Boaz, Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the, the father of David. So you see this passage starts off with Boaz and Ruth getting married and having a son, which maybe seems like a given that when they get married, then they have a child. Uh, but I want to point out in chapter one, which was, you know, a few weeks back, Ruth had married her husband in Moab, and they were married for about 10 years. There was a, a span of several years after she got married before the sons died and Naomi moves back to Israel. And that whole time, they would have been waiting for a son. Um, so I just wanted to point out that there had already been somewhat of a wait for this male heir that this passage is talking about even before the sons passed away and Naomi moves back to Israel. Then this passage moves on to the celebration of the son that was born to Ruth. Here it's important to remember Naomi was completely hopeless in the sense of having a son who would take care of her when she got older and to, uh, who would inherit Elimelech's land. And we'll talk a little bit more later about the importance for families to have this the son to carry on the family name and family line. But now, the women of Bethlehem are celebrating that Naomi does finally have a son, even though she isn't the one who gave birth to the baby. According to Jewish tradition, it's a son that will carry on the family line. There's also this interesting phrase in verse 15, celebrating Ruth as being better than having seven sons. So like, what's that about? So let's unpack that a little bit. Um, so I know we've mentioned a few times that culturally it was very important to have sons to fam- carry on the family line, inherit land. And what's better than having just one son? But having, well, I don't know what, so what's the perfect number? Well, seven was considered the perfect number. So seven sons was considered the perfect number of sons to have. And here the women in Bethlehem are saying, Ruth as the daughter-in-law is better than having seven sons. Um, so now my mom would agree that it's definitely a blessing having a wonderful, kind daughter-in-law. And I did there, yeah. Uh, but uh, it's important to note that God's provision for Naomi came through Ruth, not what society t- would have told Naomi to put her hope in. Um, we would do well to remember that ourselves, not to put our hope in things society tells to, us to put our hope in, whether that's family, relationships, a job, house, money, anything of this world that we might put our hope in. And we'll circle back to that later when we talk about some actions that we can take. So this passage wraps up with the genealogy that starts with Perez, who was the son of Judah, and then ends with King David. Now, I'm guessing not too many of us have cool Bible first decorations around our house with the verses of genealogy lists. No, no one has Ruth um, 18 through 22. But uh, I, this is actually um, something I look at that's, I think, a very powerful, hopeful passage. Uh, so this genealogy list, just so you know, it goes from the original 12 tribes of Israel to the time in Israel, to the time in the wilderness, to finally getting their promised land, through the years of the judges, and then finally to King David. And through all of those years, God loved and cared for the Jewish people. And to me, that's a powerful thing to reflect on when it comes to God's faithfulness to his people. Now, let's think about how this text applies to us today. Right? So here's an account of two seemingly typical, unremarkable women who lived thousands of years ago. How does this matter to us today? Well, the first thing I want to tell you about, which like struck me, like it hit me like a two by four when I was uh, studying this passage, everything else in this book will hopefully hit a little bit more home um, once we understand this, that we are all Naomi. Naomi's story is all of us. Uh, Naomi goes from being completely hopeless and unable to help herself 
based on the events of chapter one. That, that's all of us. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves when it comes to redeeming our sinful nature. But good news, and that's God provided for Naomi just like he provided for us too. So the second application from this passage is that we are family. Kind of like, you know, the, the song, I don't know, that's how my brain works, thinking song lyrics and movie references. Um, but what I mean by that is Naomi married Elimelech, and now her identity in the Jewish culture is found in this family, in this family line. That's what the big deal is for Naomi when Ruth had her baby son, and why the women of Bethlehem said, son has been born to Naomi, in verse 17. Even though Naomi didn't herself, she wasn't the one who gave birth to Obed, in the eyes of Jewish society, he's considered a son to her. So just like Naomi's identity was found in Elimelech's family line, our, our identity is found in a new family when we place our faith in Jesus Christ. And that's a big deal for us because that means God, the master and creator of the universe, adopts us as his own, and he gets to be our daddy, our Abba Father. That made me think of the passage Paul wrote in Romans 8. And I'll talk about this passage a little bit more later, but holy cow, this is, is quite the passage. I forgot all of the things that uh, were in Romans 8. And he writes in this chapter about how we're adopted as his children and can cry, Abba, Father, which is the, the way a small child would, you know, that's what they would call their daddy. That's this morning when I helped Andrew get out of the van. He said, Dad, uh, that, that, uh, that's that word. That's the word we get to use when we approach the master and creator of the universe. Um, so I've hinted at how Naomi was redeemed when a male heir was born into her family. And that's our third application for this text today. That God's redemption is more glorious than we can imagine. And hopefully that, that will sink in as, as we start to talk about God's redemption for us is more glorious than we could possibly imagine. When Naomi's husband and sons passed away without a male heir, she was utterly hopeless. Um, and we'll, it seems like we've been talking about that a lot. It's, it's a big deal. This is a really, really bad situation for Naomi in the eyes of um, society at the time. So um, she was utterly hopeless. And then through God's provision, Ruth and Boaz had a son who will continue on the family line and will be the guardian redeemer mentioned in our passage today. Uh, now, I know, like I said, we mentioned this a few times, um, but it was, so hopefully we've established this is a really big deal for Naomi for a son to be born in this family line. But let's remember who's born down the road in this family line, right? So Obed's the father of Jesse, and then Jesse's the father of King David. So not only does Naomi finally have a son, but the son is the grandfather of King David. She goes from being utterly hopeless to just a couple generations down the road, King David. Now, uh, redemption coming in the form of a baby boy. Does that sound familiar? A baby boy coming to redeem us. Anybody? I see some, I see some people, some light bulbs out there, right? That's, that's Jesus, right? And if we remember, Jesus Christ was also in the line of King David. So not only does Naomi finally have a son, but this redemption, having a, a male heir, a son born into this family line, happens in literally the most glorious way possible for her, right? King David, and then eventually Jesus Christ. So, Wow, big deal, right? Now, now that we're talking about redemption, it reminds me of this physical church building. So for those of you who don't know, this building was literally redeemed in the sense that it was condemned to destruction and then bought back. And that's, that's a very powerful uh, testament that, um, that exists here in our community. Um, and not only was the building bought, but many people have been giving of their time and talent and money to restore this building. Dory moving 450 blocks. Uh, not all at the same time, though, right? Or maybe? Oh, two at a time? <laughs> so uh, God is clearly using this physical building and its history and the ministry that happens here to, to do some amazing things. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying anything we have done is worthy of boasting about. And, and by no means should we be worshiping this physical building. 
But God is clearly on the move here. He's definitely doing something. If you get a chance to spend some time here throughout the week working on projects, uh, I know last summer when we were building that retaining wall, it was about, you know, once or twice a week, Pastor Florin would call me up and, hey, Nate, can you come over and help, uh, I don't know, shovel dra- uh, gravel um, or help, help with the retaining wall? And there were people who would stop by on a regular basis uh, just throughout the week. And a lot of those people have some personal connection to this building. And they're just stopping by to see the building. Um, it, I don't, I mean, for those of you who don't know, this, this building was going to be torn down. And so some people uh, are still stopping by. Oh, I, I didn't know this building was still going to be here. Um, and so these people who stop by are so happy that A, it's still here, and B, it's still being used as a church. Our security cameras we have on the property fairly regularly pick up people who stop at the front steps, many times in the middle of the night when they know no one else is going to be here to pray, um, kneel and, and pray. And God only knows what brought them here. But the point is that they're, they're being brought here. And you never know what seed is being planted from that. And that's possible because this building was redeemed. Now, there's another glorious redemption I, I want to tell you about. Actually, I didn't tell Tom I was going to do this. Tom, can you come, come over here? So you don't have to do anything, you just have to stand here. So, there's another glorious redemption I want to tell you about. We all know that God surely cared about Naomi and her well-being by providing her, her with a guardian redeemer. We know that God cares about this physical building because he's provided time after time, most recently for the, the chimney, um, and, and when it looks like something wasn't possible. And those are two really big, important things. But if you think about it, How much more important is Tom's redemption to God than those other things, right? I mean, so Naomi having a male heir, saving this physical building, pale in comparison to how much it means to God that he gets to be Tom's Abba Father, my Abba Father, your Abba Father, right? Uh, Thanks, Tom. Uh, But, so... You see that we're all hopeless in that we're sinners. We're not perfect. And therefore, we can't have a relationship with God who is perfect and holy. But he loved us so much and wanted us, want, wanted us to be able to have a relationship with him so much. So he sent his perfect son to die so that we could be redeemed. And to, to me, what, you know, what, I, what I've learned about God, that, that seems like a much bigger deal to him than any of the other redemptions I was talking about, even if it was just one of us, right? But that's available to all of us. So, in response, like, what, what do we do in response to being so gloriously redeemed by our Father in heaven? Well, we need to find our new identity in him, just like Naomi, and especially Ruth, who left her home country to move to Israel, found their identity in their husband's family line. What can we start doing today in order to find our new identity in him. Well, part of that means we have to abandon our old selves, our old identity. Now, I realize this is a a big idea to wrap our heads around, and by no means do I claim to have this all figured out. But getting to really dig in and spend time in this passage helped me to see a, a few different areas maybe where we could do this. And the first is that we all need to recognize and abandon anything we might find our identity, hope, or redemption in besides God and the glorious redemption we have in him. Now, many of these things might actually be good things, like family or helping others or a job or a hobby. Um, And uh, let's see. But we may need to change how how we think about these things or uh, the role that they play in our lives. You know, a couple weeks ago, Pastor Florin talked about how to resist the schemes of the devil. And it's important for us to realize the most effective schemes are the ones that we aren't aware of. You see, if we've placed our faith in God, the devil's going to be doing whatever he can to make us a less effective follower of Christ and follow God's will in our lives less effectively. And clearly there are sinful, bad things the devil may try to ensnare us in, but a more devious plot would be to have something that seems noble and good take our focus and dedication away from God, be it ever so slightly. 
it could be something that might change the trajectory of your life, you know, just a little bit. It's not really even noticeable, but over time, you become a less effective follower of Christ. For example, you may have noticed that Andrew and Caleb, our two little guys, bring a lot of joy to me. But clearly, I would not be following God's will for my life or being as effective at following Christ if they were my source of fulfillment and hope, right? I can't find my fulfillment and hope and redemption in my family. Or for a lot of people, it might be their work. I'm a high school teacher, and I would like to think that my job, I could have, you know, somewhat of a positive impact on others. And I know for me, it's easy to have school stuff occupy a lot of my thought life or bring, it could be a big source of stress that I bring home. And again, that's not making me, even though that might be a noble thing I'm trying to do, that's not making me a better follower of Christ or um, uh, follow God's will as effectively. Now, you might be thinking this whole abandoning things sounds like a bummer. And, and sometimes it might be a big change that we're called to make. But sometimes it might be more of a, sh a shift in perspective. And in any case, you're better off. So example of this, so I'm a, a lifelong Packer fan. And I'd say my dedication is, you know, moderate. Like if the Packers were playing, I'd probably be watching the game. And, um, you know, I was maybe more than a little bummed when they lost playoff games they should have won. Year after year after year after year. Uh, but that was before Andrew was born. Well, these last couple of football seasons, I barely watched any Packer games just because I'm doing other things. I sometimes don't even know the game's on. I have other things on my radar, uh, be, you know, being a father. So, uh, now, th this past season when the Packers beat the Cowboys by a million points in the playoffs. That did bring me an immense amount of joy. But does that joy really compare to, you know, getting, you know, riding in the car, getting to sing raise a hallelujah word for word with Andrew, or getting to see Caleb starting to smile and look around for his brother's voice? You know, that, that joy is so much more, right? Now, like that, finding our hope and identity in God's redemption only a million times better. Um, God's glorious redemption is, is so much more wonderful and important than anything that we can find in this world. Um, another action we can take knowing, um, is, is knowing when we might need to abandon our, our need for control and look to God in order to do the next right thing. Now, if that Next right thing line sounds familiar. Yes, I did steal that from Frozen 2, um, but it, it works. So there, you know, there's a lot of different directions we could go with this idea of giving up control, right? But I think a specific area of action we could look at when we think about the book of Ruth is how do we respond to the needs of others when we see other people going through some kind of tragedy? And let's face it, there's a lot of heartbreaking things that we see every day. As it would turn out, um, as I've been working through this passage to get this message ready for this morning, over the last month or so, my wife and I, we've actually been trying to figure out um, how we can support a family in our community who's gone through a tragic loss. And as I've been, we've been wrestling through what we're being called to do, I've gotten to have a couple conversations with Pastor Florin. And one thing he told me is that sometimes we may have to abandon our own preference or what makes us comfortable when we're responding to a situation like this. Sometimes we may simply be called to pray over a situation. And for some people, their preference is to get kind of caught up in the busyness of helping people. So that might be not what they're comfortable with. Other times we might be more comfortable simply praying, but we're being called to get more involved. I know a lot of times it, when we see someone in need, it's, it's easy with you know, social media, Facebook, um, to see, you know, these, go, like a GoFundMe for somebody. And so just to give some money to a GoFundMe. Now, don't get me wrong, that money might be a blessing to the person in that situation. But maybe you're being called to get even more directly involved, form a relationship with somebody and come alongside them um, so you can support them over the long term. We see in the book of Ruth how Ruth responded to the tragic situation Naomi was in, even in the midst of her own tragedy. And Boaz also responded to seeing Naomi and Ruth in need. In the passage we looked at today, 
we see the culmination of that response in the way Naomi was blessed by Ruth giving birth to Obed. I hope that encourages all of us to earnestly go to the Lord for discernment when we see something that really tugs at our heart, uh, tugs at us and ask, okay, Lord, what, what is it that you are having me do? And then do the next right thing. Y you may just be the provision God uses to bring someone to faith or to encourage someone in their faith. The last thing that we can all do this week as we work to ab abandon ourselves and seek our identity in God's glorious redemption is to reflect on what part of Naomi's story do we relate to right now? Earlier, I mentioned that Naomi really actually represents all of us as we go from being utterly hopeless to gloriously redeemed. That starting point for all of us is that we have to realize we are spiritually hopeless without God's redemption. Because of our sin, we cannot have a relationship with God, but he made a way for us to have a relationship with him. Good news, he redeemed us. For other people, there may be hard circumstances that can make you feel hopeless in your life right now. How do we glorify God when we face hardships like Naomi faced? As with anything, we should turn to scripture, right? Lamentations, Psalms, Job are full of verses where the writers are saying to God, where are you? I am in pain. In Psalm 6.6, 6, the psalmist writes, I am exhausted as I groan. All night long, I drench my bed in tears. My tears saturate the cushions beneath me. You can just feel the agony in those words. And how blessed are we that we can bring that agony to a God who hears us and loves us. And then finally, we get to the happy ending for Naomi at the end of the book of Ruth, where she is redeemed in the most glorious way possible. If we are redeemed, the way our lives, the way we live our lives should reflect that, right? Uh, so if this is you, definitely make time this week or as soon as you can to, to read Romans 8. It describes how we're adopted by God, we're co-heirs with Christ, and also have the Holy Spirit come and live inside us. So that, that passage could turn into a whole message on its own. I'll just leave it at that. But you should read it with the realization that we have been gloriously redeemed. So this morning, I, I hope this message has encouraged all of you in some way. I know, um, I know Pastor Floor mentions a lot of times, he has, preaches a message to himself first. Um, and for me, it was <laughs> just the, the different things that I had going on in, in my life, um, quite the, the blessing and um, something I, I was able to learn a lot of lessons from. And we were kind of joking that all of the different circumstances that led to me getting to study this passage to bring up a, a message this morning it was so far out of any of our control, um, but things that really apply to, to me and in, in my life where I am right now. Um, and it was a blessing to dig into um, this passage, the book of Ruth, and all the different rabbit holes that went down. And I hope it was a blessing for you as well to see how the story from the book of Ruth points to redemption. And in the coming weeks, let's look for all the different ways that we see God's glorious redemption uh, at work in our lives. So next, we will have Dan come up for um, some announcements, and then we'll have one more song as well.